Okay, well, welcome everybody. We're excited to have Samuel's uh, thesis defense today. And uh, let me just give a little bit of background about uh, Samuel. He's He's been in the PRISM group for the last couple of years. Before that, he uh, graduated with his undergraduate uh, from BYU in April of 2017, and then worked for about two years, one, one year, nine months with Reliable Controls Corporation. He commissioned a uh, startup, a gold leaching plant. He developed uh, HMI display screens for DCS programs um, and, and worked with different DCS vendor equipment. So he has a lot of good uh, controls, uh, especially practical experience in the field uh, at working. Um, and he's also worked uh, recently with FL Schmidt uh, on some of the development of intelligent strategies for advanced process control, with uh, data-driven models, time series forecasting, machine learning, and deep learning with uh, model predictive control. Um, Sam is uh, just finishing up his project. He's going to be working with reliable controls this summer and is working with them right now. Uh, and then he's going to be starting a PhD at BYU. So we're excited to get Sam back and uh, we're excited to see uh, what he's going to present today. And Sam, uh, thanks for all your efforts. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you now. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Finger, for, for the introduction. And it has been a, a really uh, satisfying journey. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm excited to show the results of our work in the past two years. Uh, like Dr. Heringer said, I've, I've been working in control controls applications for the most part. So joining this uh, UAV world was a new experience to me, but really exciting. And, and I learned a lot of things. Uh, also, thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, well, the, the title of my thesis project is uh, Automated 3D Reconstruction Using Optimized View Planning Algorithms for uh, Iterative Development of Structure for Motion Models. Now, that's a really big uh, topic. It's really long, but we'll, we'll talk about it and, and see what everything means. Uh, first of all, I, I've been doing my work with the BYU Prison Group and also the, the newly formed Rome group, which stands for Research and Optimized Aerial Monitoring, uh, which developed as part of this collaboration with the civil engineers. And all the funding for this project has, has come through the Center for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge their, their support. Uh, also, of course, I'd like to acknowledge all the support of, of my graduate committee, Dr. Hengren, Dr. Nickerson, and Dr. Frankie. Thank you for being my thesis. Thank you for joining this uh, thesis defense in last minute. And also, really thanks to uh, the research team, Corey, Josh, Valerie, Joseph, and Nicole, Adam, and Bryce. Uh, they've done an amazing job, and they deserve uh, credit for, for all that we're going to present today. And also, uh, Mark read, we, we had a, a good collaboration in one of our machine learning classes, and that developed into a a big piece of this project, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge his help as well. So, um, the Center for, Orma for Unmanned Aircraft Systems uh, is, a, is an industry-led uh, group, uh, and, and the focus is to develop applications, industrial applications, using uh, unmanned aircraft, uh, un unmanned aerial uh, vehicles or, or drones, right? So. There's a big interest in the industry for the developing these type of applications. Major oil and gas companies have been doing this for the past 10 years. And the applications go anywhere from developing three-dimensional models to even thermal models of, of their equipment. And this is because using UAVs can help them identify unsafe conditions or underperforming equipment without the risk associated with sending someone to to the plant or the cost associated with, with inspecting hundreds and hundreds of pieces of equipment. As part of the, the applications or, or, yeah, as part of the applications of UAVs, there's this specific one called structure for motion. Structure for motion is not 
necessarily exclusive to UAVs or drones. This is something that's been developed for a long time. And it consists of using two-dimensional images and then stitching them together and create three-dimensional models. And it's a, it's a really interesting and, and very effective technology because it, it uses inexpensive equipment as compared to laser sensors, which are very, uh, very common, but also very expensive, while maintaining high quality results. And there's been a lot of research where we compare structure from motion models to LIDAR models or laser-based models. And, and they are very similar in quality, except that the structure from motion models are a lot easier to develop because you don't need all that expensive and sophisticated equipment. So combining these two ideas of using structure for motion and, and UAVs for uh, inspection of industrial equipment, our group has developed this expertise on optimization of UAV-based uh, surveillance or, or monitoring using this specific technique, structure for motion. And this is really helpful because we can optimize the, you know, the use of, of, of the drone's battery and because it reduces the computational cost. One of the disadvantages of structure for motion is that you need hundreds of photographs and then you need to process those photographs in a computer. And that usually takes a very long time. Some of the models that our group has developed from, from Italy, for instance, it's thousands of photographs and, and they take days to render even in, in very powerful computers. So there's a very uh, uh, strong incentive to reduce the number of photographs. If we can do the same, if we can achieve the same quality of models with less photographs, we definitely want to do that. And just to put uh, my research in, in context, this is uh, a very simplified timeline of what people have done in, in this area. It's a structure for motion, like I said, goes back all the way to 1991, perhaps earlier, but this is one of the most important publications on structure for motion. Uh, these authors realized that if we can find correspondence between images or similar points between images, we can use that to our advantage and stitch them together and put them together in a three-dimensional model because we can infer their, their position based on their motion. So given number n of cameras, we can infer their position as well. And then that has developed into pretty much two branches of how to optimize structure for motion. And, and it's been called uh, optimized view planning. Right? The, the plan or the, the position of these cameras can be optimized for maximum correspondence between images to accelerate the, the three-dimensional reconstruction. And people have taken pretty much two approaches. One of them is an online approach where we develop the model as we go, as we learn things about the model. And the other one is we develop an optimized view plan based on previous information about the model. And in, in our group specifically, uh, we have spent the past few years in this second area, which is uh, using previous information or using previous models, how can we improve the, the view planning? And my work, the work that I'm going to present today, builds on, on this excellent work done by, by former students, uh, namely uh, Abe Martin and uh, uh, Ivan uh, Rojas, uh, Trent Oxon, all these uh, people that have been developing these applications and they've been doing mostly uh, optimization based on previous models. Uh, one of the latest uh, papers that, that our group published was on, on how using a, a previous three-dimensional model or elevation map, we can reduce the number of photographs up to 25% or down by 25% while maintaining quality and we can even use even more photographs or regions of interest for a targeted um, approach and a refined model only at areas of interest. 
and this is uh, one of the this comes from those publications that I was talking about and what we found is that if we want to map an area based on previous information we're going to have a three-dimensional point cloud this is going to be hundreds of thousands to millions of points and if we know where these points are in the three-dimensional space we can calculate a subset of cameras that will capture most of the points or all of the points without having to capture every single one or without having it being an arbitrary decision but more of a mathematical response to it and this is what this is the latest that we've developed we can we can take a previous model we can generate an optimized flight plan around it that's going to use 25 percent less pictures and maintain the quality but then we ask a question we wanted to take a step forward and say okay can we develop optimized flight plans that do not depend on the previous models. In other words, can we use this same technology, the same ideas that we've been developing for years and move to the other branch of research that is the online approach? Can we do it if we didn't have our previous model? And we've answered that question and we said, yes, yes, we can. And as a result, we have developed a method for optimized view planning that is independent of previous information and along the way, we found that we can also make it autonomous, meaning not only is it optimized, but because it's an online approach, um, it can make decisions on, on its own. It doesn't need, um, it, it requires very minimal input from, from the user. And we validated the performance of this algorithm using a simulated environments and also a, a field study. The way we did this or the way we approach this, well, maybe we can develop a three-dimensional model if we build it one step at a time based on an incomplete model. And the incomplete model can be very, very incomplete. It can be as small as a, a, a few a hundreds of points or thousands of points instead of the millions of points that we usually use. And that should be enough to initialize the algorithm and guide us in the direction where we need to gather more information. And, and here's one of our, one of our experiments. We, we have this incomplete model. And if we use the algorithms that we have previously developed, we would be taking pictures only at the, at the locations where we know there's, there's something. But with this automated uh, iterative approach, we are taking pictures only where there's no information. So eventually we are able to complete the model and this is all done autonomously. And that was our first observation after doing some preliminary research and saying, well, how, what can we, how can we approach this? We decided that the three-dimensional model can be reconstructed in iterations if we can identify the deficiencies. In other words, let's start with the tiniest uh, point cloud that we can use, and then let's identify the deficiencies and take pictures at those deficiencies. So that was our first step. We need to initialize the algorithm. We need to initialize the model. And this is an example where we take only three photographs. This took 10 minutes. Someone flew this uh, manually, took three photographs, and this is what we get. This is a, uh, this is a water tank, a decommissioned water tank in, in Provo. If you've gone to Rock Canyon Park, you've probably seen it right next to where we have our opening socials every summer. Now, next time we have socials, you'll see it and you'll remember my research. But this is only three pictures and it takes five minutes to render this. And this is all we need. And after that, we let the computer do all the work. No, no more uh, pictures needed from the user. Additionally, we could use elevation maps. Or we could use any sort of information, but it doesn't have to be complete. The next thing is we want to identify the deficiencies. And the way we did this is through a key nearest neighbors analysis. So we look at this point cloud and we realize that if we start clustering the points and measuring the distance with their nearest neighbors, we're going to find that the centroid of that cluster will be at a larger, the, the distance between the centroid of that cluster and a point 
at the boundary of a deficiency is larger. Right? As it's, it's shown in this uh, image, if we're analyzing this point, point A, it is really close to its centroid, which means uh, it's not at the, at the edge of the deficiency. But this one here is telling us, look, this is where your model ends. This is where your model, where I, I have no more points. So this is where you will probably want to take the next picture. To decide on which uh, distance to, will classify our points as a deficiency, we're using the 90th percentile, percentile of, of that distance to century distribution. And that turn, turned out to be uh, really good. So this is what we, what we get when we do that analysis. k nearest neighbors using the 90th percentile as a uh, distance threshold. We can identify all the places where the model is incomplete. That is the first step and it works really well. We only need less than one minute in a computer to, to process a few million points. And then of course, we don't want all the boundary points like the edges of the model. We don't want those. So we get rid of those and we only keep the relevant parts of the object of, of interest. So now this is where we want to take the pictures. This is where we want to gather new information, combine it with the previous information and refine our model. Uh, but there is a problem. We, we can't take a picture of all the points. Right? We need to, uh, the points belong to different planes in the three dimensional space. So if I wanted to capture all the deficiencies with a single picture, it would probably not be the best idea. That's, that's a picture on the left. And if I want to take more pictures, I need to come with a, with a strategy. I need to decide which planes I want to cover so that I cover most of the deficiencies. So that led us to, to a second observation. There must be an optimal number of cameras or an optimal number of planes that will map or will capture all the deficiencies because the deficiencies rely on different planes in three-dimensional space. So we did a little bit of research on how we could find these different planes. And we came across this clustering algorithm, uh, which is part of, of an unsupervised machine learning um, algorithm. It's called density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise, or DB scan for, for sure. Um, and what it does is it looks at the points in the three-dimensional space and based on their position and its density, uh, it can cluster and it starts making these groups. And it has two adjustable parameters. That is uh, epsilon, which is a radius of the neighborhood around a point. And also uh, there's, there has to be a minimum number of points um, to make the analysis, just like the k nearest neighbors analysis, we, we, we have to narrow it down to a number of points to make the analysis. So we started using DB scans uh, just to see what we could find. And this is what we found. This is uh, the analysis using epsilon, a very small value of epsilon. Um, what happens is if the epsilon is too small, meaning if points have to be very close together to be considered as in the same plane or in the same space, then everything is noise because everything's spread out and everything is noise and, and it's canceled except for these two tiny clusters. As we increase epsilon, we start getting more, more clusters. This is a much better example where it says, it looks like all these points in orange belong to the same plane, but these points in uh, pink or green, they belong to a different space, uh, to a different plane in the three-dimensional space. So you probably want to take a picture at those different, those two different locations. And we continue uh, increasing epsilon. And if we if it may if we make epsilon too long, then everything belongs to the same, to the same plane in, in the three space or to the same cluster. So that led us to to the next observation, which is, well, that means that there must be an optimal value of epsilon that will maximize the number of clusters. And that will maximize our chances of capturing all the deficiencies that we want. 
the way I understand this is it's like making an approximation. If we have a, a tank if we, and we want to approximate it with, uh, with the geometric figure and we use a sphere, for instance, then it will not approximate everything. But if instead of a sphere, we start using a, a different structure with more faces, then we have a much better chance of approximating the, the object. And we're doing this with DB scan. That's what the DB scan algorithm is, is doing. It's approximating different faces of the object. And and sure enough, we we uh, try different values of epsilon f, and this is what we find. There is a sweet spot. There is a maximum number of clusters or maximum number of faces. And we just need to find the right value of epsilon. So we decided to do this with an optimization subroutine, a genetic algorithm, which is a gradient-free uh, optimization subroutine. And uh, not to spend a lot of time with the genetic algorithm, it's a, it uses the same principles of genetics in, its, in nature. So there's a population, an initial population of candidate solutions or candidate values of epsilon. Uh, and then the, the fitness function or our objective function is evaluated at each iteration or at each generation in this case. And we take only the best values of epsilon and we develop a new generation. And eventually we can find uh, an optimal value. And it turned out very well. It turned out to, to approximate um, the, the local very well. This is uh, with epsilon a value of two, which looks really close to the to the optimal. We did this with several different environments. We'll show those later. But uh, generic algorithm in combination with the density-based clustering with DB scan algorithm is the core contribution of this uh, project because it enables the, the algorithm to act autonomously. Meaning we can fly the drone, we can take a few pictures, and then that model goes to the computer. The computer does this analysis and it can repeat the analysis over and over and over again. And every time it's gonna find new faces, every time it's gonna approximate the object better and better until we have a complete model. And, and we'll show some of those results later. So now that we have a maximum number of of cluster or faces, the idea is we want to take a picture, we want to uh, fly the drone and take a picture looking straight at that deficiency or, or at that cluster of boundary points. And, and that's what we're doing next. Uh, for this specific algorithm, we're using principal components analysis. It's probably not necessary to use principal components analysis because it's only three dimensions and we're not reducing the dimensions, but it, it's just a very convenient way of, of finding a best fitting plane. It, by definition, principal components analysis, PCA, will, will give us the, the two principal components will span that plane that minimizes the distance between, uh, between points. So it's just a very convenient way of, of finding that best fitting plane for each cluster. And there's, uh, uh, there's libraries available to do this faster in an optimized way so they can handle um, several millions of, of points like is uh, our case with structure from motion. Uh, so this is what's happening here. Here's the two principal components spanning the plane. And then the last component is what we use as the normal to that plane. And we extend that normal uh, to a safety height where we're gonna take the next picture. So this is what, what it looks like in the end. And here's all the different efficiencies. Here's uh, as, as they've been calculated by the, by the DB scan algorithm, optimized with the generic algorithm. And then here's where we're going to take the next pictures. So then we uh, moved on to doing some experimentals, uh, some experiments with, with this algorithm. And first we used AirSim. AirSim uh, is a, an open source free software that we've used in the past in our research group and that other 
research institutions use it extensively. And we have three different environments that, that we use. The first one is just a landscape environment, then a neighborhood environment, and finally this refinery environment, uh, all of them increasing in, in complexity. And this is what we found. We found that after flying with this approach, a number of iterations, the GSD, the ground sampling distance, or in other words, the coverage of terrain as measured by meters or centimeters per pixel, or the resolution of the model will decrease, will, will increase, the ground sampling distance will decrease, meaning higher resolution, right? higher coverage of, of ground per, um, per, per pixel. And it will reach, it will reach this, uh, it will exhibit this asymptotic behavior, which is what we expected. After several iterations, the model decreases, and it decreases, the, the, sorry, the GSD decreases, the model resolution increases, and it reaches a limit, which is the limit of the, of the camera. Uh, the camera can only take pictures to a certain resolution, so this is that limit. And, and this was surprising, and it was, well, it was not surprising, but we took this to our advantage, meaning we can probably add a convergence criteria to our algorithm we can tell the, the algorithm when to stop. And that is after it, uh, it has reached a certain improvement in, in resolution or after it, it stops changing its resolution after several iterations. This is a result from flying on the landscape, the neighborhood, and the refinery. The refinery exhibits this weird um, behavior, but it's because of the complexity of the objects in there. To, uh, to complement this analysis, we also plotted the number of points. And, and this helps us corroborate that, yes, there are more, the number of points is not increasing anymore, meaning we're not adding more to the model after several iterations. But we can increase the model resolution in just a few iterations. This one shows more than 15, 25% improvement just in the, in the first four iterations. All right, so that led us to our, our final observation. We can use the model resolution, the ground sampling distance, as a metric for convergence in autonomous emissions. And this is what we did in AirSim. We, uh, we will run, we'll put this algorithm in a Python script, then we'll open AirSim, we will click start mission and we will say stop emission when you have reached 25% improvement in your GSD or in your, in your uh, resolution. We'll click go and we will leave the computer running for several hours. We'll come back after four or five hours to find a complete model and the algorithm saying we finished. We have mapped the area. We have reached the 25% improvement in resolution and all the decisions were made by the drone autonomously using the the uh, db scan and generic algorithm and this is that result right? we will start with this model a few pictures and then a few hours later we will come back and we'll see this model refined and with the objects of interest completely mapped it will be only eight iterations later that usually corresponds to uh, between in, in our simulations that corresponded to 50 to 100 pictures every, um, in every iteration. As a second measure, as another way to measure how effectively this algorithm is working, we are using a coverage map. The three-dimensional, the software that we use to render these three-dimensional models is called MetaShape, Agisoft MetaShape, it's used widely, wild, um, widely used in industry. And what we're seeing here is the number of cameras that overlap. We started with, and it's probably hard to see here, but there's nine points here. This was our initial flight, nine cameras, nine, nine images. And the, the scale, the color scale is in the left. The blue 
uh, the blue areas correspond to nine or more pictures that overlap. And that is really good. We want as many pictures to overlap because that's how structure for motion works. And then the yellow, gray, yellow, orange, red uh, colors, those are the areas that didn't quite have enough pictures to overlap. After just a few iterations, after just three iterations, most of the area of interest has been has enough pictures to has enough images to assure correspondence, and that's uh, really good results for algorithm. It only takes three or four iterations, and we've managed to cover all the areas that didn't have enough correspondence in the initial iteration. And then we, we decided to move from the simulation environment and do a field study. And con very conveniently for us, there's, there's this uh, decommissioned water tank in Rock Canyon Park, we called uh, Provo Parks and Grounds. And they said, yes, go ahead and you can fly a small UAV. So we started testing in, in this field study. And these are the results. They are, uh, Again, with, if we compare with the simulation, they are similar because they exhibit this uh, abnormal behavior. And we were a little confused uh, about this because we were expecting it to, the, the ground sampling distance, we were expecting that to, to go down. And we're still, uh, but we're still seeing an increase in number of points and more importantly, an increase in coverage. And as we'll see in the next few slides, the model is improving. And so that led us to think that the ground sampling distance is perhaps, uh, we need to refine that, that will be part maybe of the of future work, to refine these convergence criteria when we have these complex objects in the area. But, but here's some of the results. We start with three pictures. Here's these three images, three dots. And there's very little overlapping, very little correspondence. And that's, that translates to a very poor and incomplete model. But in only four iterations, we are able to have more than nine photographs, more than nine images sharing correspondence and having a, a complete model of the tank. Here's the evolution of the model. The first iteration, uh, we're naming the, the initial of the model iteration zero. So iteration zero will be the three photographs, the three images. This is the iteration after iteration one, that's with 21 uh, photographs, that's with 43 and 70, and finally with 100 cameras. And we, we can finally map the entirety of the tank. And, and the only thing we did here is we would load this flight plan to the drone. The drone will come back with new photographs. Those photographs will be combined with the previous photographs and we would run the algorithm, load the next view plan, and let the drone uh, fly those points. There is hardware limitations currently, but if we could have a powerful enough computer in a drone, this algorithm could have done this job that we see here, this evolution between 21 to 106. But this evolution of the model could have been performed on the fly with zero uh, intervention from, from the user. And that is one of the big accomplishments of, of this project in the, in the artificial intelligence and, and machine learning algorithms that we use. One of the goals is to mimic the behavior of, of a, an experienced user or a person. If, if a person were to fly this, he could probably accomplish, they could probably accomplish this. But we are having a, a drone do it, a drone take the, make the decisions on where to take the next pictures. And here's a, let's see if I can run this. A three-dimensional, here's where a three-dimensional model looks like at the end. So as part of, of this uh, evaluation of how intelligent per se, how well are we approximating what an experienced user would do, we compared our model with one of the models generated by, by one of our 
our students. In this model, they used 416 images and, and the model looks beautiful, right? It's complete, it has all the edges, uh, all the parts of the model are complete. But this is because people were evaluating and taking uh, photographs where they, where they would deem necessary. We compared to our approach, which was autonomous, and it only used 106 images. And what we found is that they are very, very similar. It, here again is uh, a comparison uh, performed with some of the software, modeling software that we use. And what we see is that if you compare those two models, this cloud to cloud comparison, most of the points are just a few units apart meaning they are very similar. They are almost uh, overlapping one, uh, one another. The second uh, metric that we use to measure the performance of this algorithm is how well it compares to something that is reproducible, right? Something that, uh, that people can do in, the field, uh, in a traditional method, which will be a great pattern. This is a very common approach to structure for motion and photogrammetry. If we take photographs looking straight down in a grid pattern and they share 85 to 80 to 85 percent overlapping, we usually get very, very good results. But that method fails when we have complex, complex uh, structures, vertical structures, because we need uh, oblique angles or we need to take pictures at, at different angles than just the grid pattern. Most of the time it works very well, but in, in this case it failed to, to capture the, the walls of the tank while our approach uh, could actually capture those walls. And we can see that in, again in, in this model and the color scale, the distribution of points is a little more spread. It's not all towards the left, which means that they're this similar, right? It just highlights, it gives a little bit of a quantitative measure to, to the comparison between models. And because this one uh, is 106 images, to, to have a more fair comparison, this is our iterative approach at iteration three. Sorry, this should have been iteration three at 70 cameras. So this is one step before our final model, 70 cameras. And this is the grid pattern at, uh, with 64 cameras. So even if we wanted to stop our algorithm one step, one step earlier, not go the full 106 cameras, uh, it's still a superior when compared to the traditional methods or, or the grid pattern. That's another uh, way to measure and another uh, highlight of, of this performance. It, it, of the performance of this algorithm, and that is, it can map uh, complex structures because it has it has the ability of infer where these faces are. That's what the deep scan algorithm is doing. It can infer that things don't belong to that plane that will be um, that will capture will be captured with a grid pattern flight, but instead we need those oblique angles, those those different angles, and and hence we have an optimized grid plan. So this is a summary of the contributions or, or the, the conclusions of this. We were able to create an automated iterative approach to do 3D reconstruction without the use of previous models. In other words, it, it works. It works, we can map something that we've never seen before. We all, all we need to do is take a small number of photographs to initial, initialize the model and then run this analysis and after a few iterations, we will have a complete model. We learned that the ground sampling distance, the GSD, and the asymptotic, asymptotic evolution of point density can be used as a convergence criteria. So eventually, we could have this be fully autonomous. Very few uh, research projects uh, out there claim to be fully autonomous. So this is a very important step towards uh, mission autonomy. And we found that it works very well with some, some environments and it could be refined with others, but it's a step towards full, uh, full autonomy in these UAV missions. And finally, we've, we feel, uh, we've shown through a field study that this 
uh, each approach can mimic the can mimic an experienced user. This is another one of the goals of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Our algorithm is intelligent enough to mimic an experienced user using 63% uh, less photographs. And finally, um, we, we can show that it is superior when it comes to comparing with, with traditional methods because it has that ability to infer shapes or to infer uh, spatial um, the spatial distribution of the points. Our work has been uh, compiled into a, into a journal article that was submitted for publication last month. We're waiting in, on comments from the reviewers, but uh, this, is, this is the goal to, to be able to publish this as a special issue that we've been invited to, to participate in and hopefully we'll hear back from, from them soon. And I would just like to end with some uh, future work. Like I said before, the convergence criteria could be refined. If we can, maybe we can create a new metric that combines the ground sampling distance resolution and the limiting behavior. And if we could find a new metric, that will be another step towards full autonomy. And we should also explore maybe optimizing both parameters in the scan algorithm, not just epsilon. We did some preliminary testing there and uh, it, was, it was messy and we realized that epsilon is really the heavier aspect uh, or it has much heavier weight in the decision of, of the clustering, but it, it will be interesting to see if we can optimize, using, optimize both parameters and, and see what happens. Also, we, we're dealing with millions of points, so to avoid the, the computational cost, we subsample this dense cloud. But there's an impact to that. The resolution will change if you go from a million points to 100,000 points, and that needs to be explored. We need to explore how we can adjust our algorithm for, for that situation. And finally, uh, in, in one of uh, my conversations with the many uh, people that visited our lab, uh, Dr. Dr. Sun, who's uh, part of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in Mexico, suggested that this is an excellent candidate for reinforcement learning. We could we have a good framework using AirSim. We could just run thousands and thousands of simulations and perhaps infer an optimized view plan, uh, pretty much from empirical information not just the, the mathematical approach that we've used so far. It will be very interesting to compare the empirical uh, results from reinforcement learning uh, versus uh, our current approach. And well, that's the, the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, and now we're gonna go to some questions, but first of all, I'm just gonna stop the recording um, and then we'll post this and others, uh, others that weren't able to attend today that wanted to see your presentation. So thank you so much, Sam, for that uh, great presentation of your work.